Thank you. Thank you, Dean Martinez, Dean Marshall, members of the Board of Directors, distinguished faculty, proud family and friends, and most important of all, class of 2010. Thank you and congratulations. You have finally made it. It is such an honor for me to share this moment of joy and celebration with you, being invited to address the Hastings graduating class is a big deal. I know this. And your invitation has even impressed other lawyers who are members of my family. And believe me, that is not easy if you know who they are. Because in addition to me, there are two other lawyers in my family. There's my wife, Maya Harris, who is the vice president of the Ford Foundation. But before that, led the ACLU right here in San Francisco. And then there's her sister, my sister-in-law, Kamala Harris, who is San Francisco's first female DA and is a graduate of this great law school. And actually, actually it's two and a half other lawyers because our daughter Mina has just finished her first year in law school as well. And let me tell you, these three women, they are no joke. <laughs> Each one is smart, talented, sharp-witted, strong-willed. These are no shrinking violets. So in one family, I've got a civil liberties lawyer, a first-year law student who never met an argument she didn't like, and San Francisco's top prosecutor. Can you even imagine what Thanksgiving dinner is like at my house? <laughs> I mean, I've got the ACLU at one end of the table, the district attorney at the other end of the table. I got the first year law student somewhere in the mix. And guess who's in the middle? And my daughter, Mina, will be arguing her her point eloquently because, as we all know, everything you needed to know about the law you learned in your first year of law school. <laughs> and she'll turn to me and she'll say, don't try to play it off. You know I'm right. <laughs> and Kamala will be arguing her point forcefully, persuasively, and she'll look at me and say, now, brother-in-law, you used to be a prosecutor yourself. You agree with what I'm saying, right? And then there's my wife. Her argument is no less forceful, no less eloquent. She'll turn to me and she'll say, honey, I know you agree with what I'm saying, right? Well, the, uh, the merits of the various arguments notwithstanding, mama didn't raise no fool. And I do not like sleeping on the couch. <laughs> but this truly is a great honor for me to be with you today. For one thing, I'm so proud of my own personal connections to Hastings. Not only as Kamala, an alum, but as you've heard, I was privileged to serve on the board of directors here for a period of time. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that you've given me to see some longtime friends and former colleagues who are on your faculty and board. And of course, I always appreciate the opportunity to get out of Washington and to come back home to the city of my birth, to the Bay Area where I grew up and where I will one day return. This is also a privilege because being with you reminds me of the unique and special bond that all law school graduates share. Because although nearly two decades in a different alma mater separate my law school graduation from yours. Believe me, I know what it took for you to get into those seats today. The all-nighters, the humor in tort cases that nobody outside of law school seems to appreciate. <laughs> and the anxiety dreams, you know, the, the one where you suddenly realize that it's the night before the final exam in a class you've never been to because you'd forgotten that you'd signed up for it at the beginning of the semester. I actually had that one last week. Yeah, so. 
Law school is the gift that keeps giving. <laughs> yes, we have shared many of the same doubts, faced the same challenges, rejoiced in the same triumphs. And these mystic cords of memory, as Lincoln called them, they bind us together in a web of common experiences, common language, and common history. And while each of you traveled different paths to get to Hastings, there was a collective appreciation amongst all law school graduates, past and present, about just what it took for you to be sitting here today. A shared understanding about the tireless effort, the personal and family sacrifice, and individual talent that conspired to bring you here to this moment. This moment of celebration, of renewal and change. This day that signifies an end as well as a beginning for you, the ones you love, and the ones who love you, especially the ones who love you. Because when this day was still just a possibility in your mind's eye, and there were times when that possibility was a little uncertain. The ones who loved you, they stood by you. When you hit that rock of resistance, maybe it was a paper or an exam, or maybe it was just a crisis of confidence that seized you in a vulnerable moment, a friend, a partner, a mother or father, a sister or brother, a spouse, a child, a pet, somebody, who was in this hall today was with you in that moment then, there to tell you, don't give up. You can do this. You must do this. You will do this. And because sometimes the only confidence you had was the faith they had in you, I want you to stand up and show them the appreciation and thanks that they've earned over these last three years. And family members, family members and friends, this class of 2010, they will continue to need your love and support for many years to come, I guarantee it. Because graduates, you enter the legal profession at a difficult hour for our nation. While our economy, economy continues to improve, there are still too many families who are hurting. Too many Americans are still looking for work especially in communities of color. And those who do have jobs are working harder for less. And as everyone here knows all too well, education is still much too expensive. Too many graduates have too few opportunities. Faced with this season of uncertainty, many are tempted to put the blinders on and to turn within. And as rational, as entirely understandable that response is given the challenges that each of us face in our own lives, I'm going to ask you to resist that temptation. For as you begin to navigate your paths as individuals trained in the law, whether you find that you end up practicing law or not, I want to challenge you to do three things. First, I want you to have the courage to serve others. Dr. King often spoke of the individual who had ascended to the heights of economic security, but who had the courage to descend to the depths of human need. At its best, the American spirit is exemplified by service, the commitment that we make to one another to stand together. And in difficult times, it is this quality that moves our nation forward in acts both good and great. When we act with one heart and one mind, as Jefferson said, we move forward as one people. Now, you don't have to have a, a law degree to serve. Anyone can serve. Yet you know that Along with great opportunities, the 
legal education you now possess brings with it great responsibility to reach out beyond the comfort of your own comfort and security and to lead in ways both big and small. And while your service need not be legal, there is no doubt that the need for your legal services will be great. As the Assistant Attorney General at the Justice Department's Civil Division, I oversee much of the federal government's litigation throughout the country. And as the United States' senior civil attorney, I'm reminded every day that in a civil justice system where you are five times more likely to prevail with legal representation than without it, access to justice requires access to quality legal services. Because when budgets tighten and courthouse doors close, the need for legal services among poor people, immigrant communities, and people of color, among working families and small businesses were trying to make it, that need grows. Now at the federal level, the Obama administration has taken some steps to close that justice gap. Last year, the president requested and Congress approved increased funding for something called the Legal Services Corporation. The organization created over 35 years ago to help poor families obtain access to the courts when they faced pressing civil legal matters. And at the Department of Justice, Attorney General Eric Holder has launched the Access to Justice Initiative, creating a permanent effort within the department to enhance the fairness and integrity of our legal system by improving access to counsel by the poor. And while these efforts to increase funding and change policy, while they are no doubt important, they are simply not enough. It will take the private bar, state and local governments, foundations, law schools. Most of all, it will take you, the class of 2010, to help us close this justice gap. No longer students of the law, you are now, as the Attorney General likes to say, stewards of the nation's justice system. And with that comes the responsibility to make service a part of your life's work.